Hi everyone, my name is Gal, and today my goal is to convince you that platform engineering is really just all about product. But before I do that, and before we start talking about platform engineering, I want us to take a stroll down memory lane and go back to the uh, early 2000s, I'd say, uh, where we had the dev organization and the ops organization and the infamous throwing over the fence problem. And most organizations at that time looked something like this. It was comprised of two main business units. One was the dev organization, and the second one was the ops organizations. And the problem was that they had misaligned, prioritize, misaligned priorities or misaligned goals. So the devs were really focused with doing what product wants, getting their features released faster, um, um, and, and just pushing stuff, no matter how big they were, down into production. And then we had the ops people who were really concerned with making sure that production was running and making sure that the system wraps and that the user can actually use it. Um, and they, what often happened was that they uh, were struggling with keeping up with all the features that developers were pushing to production and that they had to maintain. So we realized that this was a problem. And then somewhere around 2008, we came together as a development community and said, OK, we have this new idea. Let's do DevOps. What is DevOps? DevOps basically is saying, let's break those two silos, the dev organization and the ops organization. Let's break it, the different silos and merge it into one team, one uh, uh, group of people that can do everything from ideation, from architecting to development to owning production. Uh, this team will do everything end to end, and then we won't have the misaligned priorities problem anymore, and we will work better as organizations. So DevOps was fine in theory, but practice shows us that only around 3% of organiza organizations actually report that they are able to do the, to leave the, you live it, you run it mentality, right? Most organizations didn't really achieve this uh, uh, DevOps ideal, and they got stuck along the way in several different uh, areas. Some teams uh, just created a DevOps team between their dev and their ops teams. We just created a third silo, right? Now we have the devs pushing for pictures, the ops worrying about production, and the DevOps doing their DevOps thing, trying to work that out. Other organizations said, OK, let's just cut the ops all out. Uh, our devs are strong enough. They can take care of the operational side of the house. Um, and what they ended up with is something that's called shadow ops, right? We have those very senior developers who are owning and uh, holding our production. This is very tired, tiring for them because they don't get all the support and all the resources they need. It's not very healthy for our production because they don't necessarily have the expertise. And also for us as managers, it's a waste of our best resource, right? Our best engineers are working on keeping production alive rather than serving new features and helping our customers. But really, most organizations just landed here. Basically, you have the dev organization, and you have the what was used to be called ops organization, which is now rebranded as the DevOps organization. But it's basically the same. The developers are still pushing for features. The DevOps are still building infrastructure and, and trying to hold what's in production. And we're back to square one with the silos. 10 years later, now we realized that this is still a problem, and we wanted to solve it. So we looked at Google, and we said, hey, Google has a nice thing going on. Uh, they call it SRE. They invented it back in the early 2000s. Um, SRE, Site Reliability Engineering, it basically means if we'll have a team that works together closely with the development, with strict methodology and rules, we can ensure that they have aligned goals and that the handoff between dev and the SRE team who holds production is effective. Now, I know it's not a full explanation of what an SRE is, but that's the gist of it. So organization looked at it, and they were like, OK, let's try to adopt it. Um, what they ended up with is this. Why did they end up with this? Because it turns out that being Google is not so easy, right? Just because you're saying that you're doing SRE doesn't mean that you've actually taken the time to understand what an SRE is, how to adopt those practices, how to uh, make sure that you measure all the right metrics in order to uh, create this collaboration between the organization. And if you're not doing that, you just end up, again, with a fancy and rebranded ops team. 
But we're past 2008 and we're past 2018. It's 2023, everyone. Let's do platform engineering, right? Let's do it. It's a new buzzword. Everyone want to do it. Uh, what is platform engineering? Platform engineering basically talks about the organi engineer organization having to build an internal developer platform. What is this internal developer platform? It's something that the rest of the developers in the company can use to simplify the workflow. It can help them focus on creating business value, and it can help them achieve this DevOps nirvana because the things that they have to maintain is production aren't as complicated as they had to before. So this is the ideal uh, uh, platform engineering on one leg. And the question that I want to answer in this session is how there isn't some cocky engineering manager coming to Berlin Buzzwords in 2025 and saying, look, platform engineering, this is what we had. Now we have the next, uh, I don't know, semantic search engineering, which is the uh, best thing uh, that will replace it. How do we avoid it? How do we actually solve this problem uh, in our organizations using platform engineering? So before I answer that question, let me just quickly introduce myself. My name is Gal Bashan. Today I'm the head of engineering at Epsagon, which was recently acquired by Cisco. Uh, during my time in Epsagon, I actually started um, there as a first developer and, and worked myself up. So I really watched the startup change. And I became really motivated and really driven to create value-driven development. Now what is value-driven development? This is something that I invented. I didn't invent it. It's, it's <laughs> common in the world, but it's uh, something that I just and named, give this name for this presentation. And the goal is for every team within my organization to be accountable for delivering value, not be accountable for creating features or not be accountable for holding infrastructure, to be accountable for helping the business. I, this is the metric that I want my teams to be aligned for. And each team has a different metric uh, of the value that they should create. Other than that, I love bouldering. And this right there is my Twitter handle if you want to connect with me later. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about four main things, all in the process of what a platform engineering team does. So the first thing that we're going to talk about are the goals. Why do we even want a platform engineering teams? Why do we need it? What purpose does it serve? Next, we'll talk about problems. When we've decided that we want a platform engineering teams, we'll talk about what kind of problems these teams need to solve. After that, we'll talk about solutions. When the team identifies the problem, how do they know which solution to choose? And lastly, what the team needs to do is to build a solution, right? Given that we know a solution is something that we want, how do we actually build it? How do we actually execute on it? So let's start with the goals. And let's talk about why we want a platform engineering team in our organization. And we kind of already talked about it, but the goal is enablement. We, the value that the platform engineering team gives our organization is to enable the rest of our developers in the company to move faster um, and to deliver value, their team value faster. And how do they do it? The platform team does it in a way that is very different than the SRE or the DevOps world. Whether the SRE or the DevOps people were talking about, OK, I want to own some of production so that um, the team can uh, do uh, the other part. For example, SRE is only production, or DevOps is actually talking about, OK, let's merge those two things. The platform engineering is talking about, and, and it can own some of production, but, but the concept is to give tools, give products that help the different teams to simplify what they need to own in their production. So the obvious example would be, OK, let's give Kubernetes as a platform so the teams don't have to manage about manage, worry about managing their cluster, but they can actually build application on top of Kubernetes. But my examples throughout these presentations are going to not be those kind of examples. They're going to be the stretch of a platform, the things that you wouldn't have normally called a platform, because platform is a very uh, flexible word. And we can use platform engineering for organization of 1,000 people that actually needs a fully fledged platform organization with 100 developers owning the Kubernetes infra. Uh, but we can actually use it in a startup, right? And we have one developer with a cool idea that can make the life of the rest of the developers easy. So let's talk about the goals, right? Let's talk about what the development, that what the platform engineering team, what are the metrics that will say uh, that it's achieved success? So there are three main areas. First one is security. 
if we, as a platform engineering team, will help the rest of our environment, help the rest of our organization build more securely, and security is something that's easy to measure, right? How many incidents do we have? How many uh, security risks does our tool flags? But if we'll be able to do that, we'll take some cognitive load off of our developers, and they'll be able to actually own their production. The second thing is cost, also pretty self-explanatory. If we provide ways for our developers to build the same thing, only cheaper, then it's an immediate value to the company, and we've actually created value within the organization. So this is the second thing, and this is a relatively simple thing that we can optimize on. The third and most vague thing is the developer experience, right? It's something that a lot of people talk about right now, the what is the developer experience and how can we measure it? But generally speaking, we want our developers to have it easy when they're trying to build new things. They want to, and we want them to be focusing on the features that they are creating and not on the boilerplate and on the CI CD, on how to get there, on the nitpicky of configuring machines. Most of the times. Some of the times we do want them to do those things. But most of the times you probably don't. So how can we measure this elusive, measure, elusive metric of developer experience? There are a few things that we can look at. We can look at cycle time. How long does it take from a uh, where a developer starts to actually build a feature until it's live in production? We can look at MTTR, which is uh, how fast from the moment a developer understood that production is down or that he has a problem until he actually until he's actually able to resolve it, mean time to resolve. We can look at, at the release frequency, how often not uh, how long does it take for one thing to get into production, but how often do we actually put things into production? The higher those metrics are, the, it's likely that our developer experience is better. But really, developer experience affects much more than this. For example, if you look at organization with bad developer experience, you'll often see high attrition rates. Just because it's hard, hard for developers to work there, and they want an environment that can support them, an environment that can actually help them do the things that they were made to do. So looking at these success metrics, it's pretty obvious why we want platform engineering team, right? It's pretty obvious why we want to improve our costs, improve our security, improve our developer experience. And now the question is, what? Like, how? And how do we do that? So assuming that we've already have a platform engineering team and we decided that we want it, now we're basically telling this team, hey, go solve problems that we have in the organization. And the development team is going to ask themselves, OK, what kind of problems do I need to solve? What are the challenges that it is my responsibility to take on? And, and we're talking about the early days of, uh, uh, of a platform engineering team where we don't have four different platform engineering team, one in charge of infrastructure, one in charge of data, and one in charge of the GitOps. Uh, we actually want to understand how we want to structure this organization. So I want to talk about the process that we do in order to choose those problems, and in order to make sure that the problem really is a problem. And the way that I want to do it is I want to tell you a story about something that we've had in Epsagon in the very early days. So at that point, we were about 10 developers. As you can imagine, 10 developers don't have a fully functional uh, platform engineering team. But we did have a senior developer with some spare time on his end and a problem that, uh, that he was aching to solve. Basically, uh, what we did at Epsagon, we were a monitoring company, an observability company, and we were focused on distributed tracing for serverless. Um, and as you can imagine, when you're working with distributed traces, you're getting a lot of data from all of your customers, um, and you're kind of doing a lot of streaming with it and a lot of data processing, storing it in databases. And our system was no different. Uh, our system was completely serverless. We used a lot of AWS Lambda, and we also used Amazon Kinesis a lot. Now, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room, based on the conference, know what Amazon Kinesis is. But if you're not, and forgive me for the brutal comparison, it's basically Amazon's version of Kafka. Um, we can manage uh, data streams using it uh, in a serverless way. Uh, and we can connect it to AWS Lambda, so we can basically get data from one point to another and using Lambda as a way to uh, process this data. So the problem that this developer was having is that he noticed that we had a lot of those Kinesis streams up and running. And the way that we debugged them was that we always deploy something to the cloud. 
there was no way to actually look at the data that is going in the stream uh, in your local computer, but we always had to deploy something to the cloud in order to debug it. So what this developer decided to do was to take a few days and to actually build a tool that mirrors the data into your local computer so you can examine it and introspect it and debug and run code against it, which sound like a pretty good idea. So we were excited about it. He built it. And then it was kind, uh, time to, for the release. He sent it in the uh, Slack for the rest of the team. Hey, look at this cool capability that I gave you that should make your life easier. A day passed, two days passed, and we realized that no one really used this tool. No one really adopted it. No one actually gained value from it. So what, what was our problem? Our problem was that this problem wasn't actually a problem. No one in the, com in the company, other than this developer, thought that this was a problem. Everyone was pretty fine deploying something to AWS Lambda to debug. It took less than a minute. Um, if you had the worst case and you actually needed the data in your computer, it was like five lines of Python to tailor case it and to get the data that you need right now into your computer. It was harder to generalize it. But just to get the solution, it was like five lines. And it just wasn't a pain point for enough of the people. So what we took from this is when we sought out to actually later build out some more tooling that our people actually need, is before we go out and solve the problem, we need to make sure that it is actually a problem within our organization. We need to come with a problem-first mindset to building a platform, not just to building a product. Now, what kind of problems can we solve? There are a lot of problems to choose from, right? We can maybe, uh, maybe our developers are wasting a lot of time on time-consuming infra. Maybe they're writing a lot of boilerplate code. Maybe it's not clear who owns what part of the code base. Maybe uh, uh, they, they're not aware of different services that are up and running and uh, that could benefit them within the company. Uh, observability can be a problem, cognitive load, a lot of different problems that our developers have, could have. Now, how can we know which of these our developer actually have? So the, prob the answer is relatively simple. We just ask them. If we go and ask our developers, hey, what problems do you have, you probably get a bucket list of, hey, this is not good, and this is, prob this is problematic, and I want to fix that. Uh, and then the more people you talk to, and the more people you follow and pair and, and uh, see what their day-to-day -day looks like, it's easier to find those common root problems that if you solve, you'll bring the most value to the organization. So we, talk about, we talked about problems. Now let's talk about solutions. And this is where platform engineering teams really shine, right? Where us as a developer, we really have the upper hand. Because when we're so looking for problems, uh, we need to talk to users. We need to understand their pain points. It doesn't necessarily our strongest suit. But when it comes to solution, we're at a conference like Berlin Buzzwords. We're learning about all the new infra. We're learning about all the new technology. It should be relatively easy for us to bring up good solutions. And the main point here that I want to make is that good is subjective. Just because a solution looks good to me, because I'm a well-vested engineer, uh, and I know what I'm doing, and I know all the, uh, why this is the best technology to solve this problem, doesn't necessarily mean that to the other side, the solution doesn't look like this. Because I, as engineers, we have the tendency that we really want to use this new cool technology. We really want to in integrate Kubernetes. We really want to integrate vector search. But we kind of end up doing, solving the problem in a way that is not something that's viable for our users, which are the developer in the company, just because we know that this is the right technology to solve it. So when we're approaching the topic of how do we solve problem, we should again focus on the value. We should look at the solution that we propose and go to our developers, to the users that we interact with, and ask them, hey, is this viable for you? Can you actually maintain this? Can you actually use this? Do you have enough technical knowledge to use this? Uh, we, we usually don't want our best engineer to think of the solution, well, we do, but we don't want our best engineer to think of the uh, solution that the rest of our engineers will have to use just because he is our best engineer. And just because he can do something doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of our engineers in our group can actually do that. So we talked about goals, we talked about problems, we talked about solutions. 
Now let's talk about how do we actually build these solutions. And here I want to share another story. Now, this is a story from my days at the IDF, uh, in the Intelligence Corps. So obviously, the story is not going to be with the exact product domain, but the rest of the details will be the same. Uh, so let's say that in the area that I worked at the IDF, uh, we had to do a lot of data processing around bagel vendors. So the product domain, instead of what it was, it's around bagels. Basically, we had to look into a lot of different vendors that supply bagels and let our, customer, let our users answer questions like, which of our vendors uh, support cheese or their bagels? Or does this specific vendor currently has bagels that has tomatoes on them? And as we matured, we added more and more and more vendors. And each of these vendors became a whole project, because all of the vendors has proprietary formats and had proprietary way in which they looked at the bagel and, and described it. So we didn't really have a system that let us do all this querying together. But for every vendor, our users had to nitpick and ask the question separately. And of course, we didn't want that, uh, not only because of our users, but also because of us. We had to bootstrap. Whenever we bootstrapped an entire product, an uh, entire project, we had to do a lot of work just to get it bootstrapped. So we decided to build this uh, framework, this platform, that describes Bagel in the, most general, in the most general way, and that the rest of the product in our organization can use it. Um, and this sounded like a, a good idea because of two things. A, we validated the problem. Everyone knew it was a problem. It was slowing us down. Uh, it was painful for the organization. We really need to solve this bootstrapping process. The second part was that we validated the solution. We actually talked with a lot of different teams and a lot of different projects. And each of them said, yeah, if you could give me this kind of library, it would be valuable for me. It would save time. I want this. So we validated the problem, we validated the solution, we were pretty confident about ourselves, and now we wanted to execute. So we had two of our best engineers uh, basically working with uh, one of the projects, understanding the requirements, and, and they literally took around six months to build this uh, platform of several libraries and, and the hosted part, which actually let different projects interact with them. And so finally, after six months, they integrated with the first project. It was a great success. Um, then they tried to integrate with the second project, and it just didn't work. Basically, it, it, it just wasn't good. The details were all, were all off. Those, uh, they didn't have support for you know, square bagels, uh, and they didn't have support for uh, uh, frozen bagels, and all, all of those things that you have uh, differences at between a uh, first and a second vendor. So what did we do wrong there, right? We validated the problem. We validated the solution. We talked with all the teams. What happened? And what happened is when we started to build out this platform, we kind of forgot that Agile is still valid. Basically, we forgot that even though we're not building a user and a product, that every two weeks uh, the customer can actually uh, log into the SaaS and see the value and, and be happy. Agile is still valid. We still could have met our customer, customers way earlier with a much smaller MVP and understand that we're not on the right track. And instead of wasting all of this time, we could have uh, uh, changed the course of this project in a way that actually is helpful for the rest of the project. So even if we just brought a fraction of the features to the second team and the third team after two weeks or after a month, we would have been much better off. So let's recap so far. We talked about how we want to build this good IDP, right? These platform teams need to build this platform that the rest of our developers in our, in our, uh, in our organization can use. So we talked about the fact that we, when we're building a platform, we need to first make sure that the platform solves a problem. Then we need to make sure that our solution is viable. After that, we need to uh, continuously go to the teams that we will be working with and make sure that the things that we're building are still viable for them, and they can actually use it, that they are usable for them. Uh, and if we need to tweak or change course, then we can do it as fast as possible. And there are a lot of stuff that we didn't touch on, right? For example, go to market. OK, so I did build this incredible platform in my company. How do I get developers on it? How do I convince 
people to actually use the thing that I'm building. It's kind of sound obvious uh, for us that we need to go to market when we're launching a product. It's not so obvious that we need to go to market when we're launching an internal product. So there are a lot of different skill sets here that aren't necessarily correlating with what an engineer, engineer skill sets are, right? Engineers are, well, they're good at a lot of things. Um, but they're mainly supposed to be good at architecting, building, operating stuff. Doesn't necessarily have to be good at market research and go to market and, and uh, validating user needs. This is a very familiar job description. The job description is of a product manager. Now, I hope that by now I have convinced you that it's not just that platform is about product in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the sense that it is a product, but also that it needs a product manager, at least skill set, in order to progress correctly. So if I have convinced you, you're probably going to go back and talk to your head of engineering or head of product and say, look, there was this very uh, nice looking guy at the Berlin Buzzwords, and he was talking about the fact that we need a product manager for our platform team. Please give me the headcount. And then uh, you're going to get a weird face from your head of engineering or your head of product. And he's going to say, no, because, and then he's going to say one of those four things. And I kind of want to break them down. The first thing that he is going to say, and it, this is one that's pretty annoying, is look, the usage of the platform is mandatory. We're telling the other teams to use the platform. Why do you need a product manager? It, it's, it is not like uh, it, we don't have the risk of people not using it. So this is a very bad move because we all know, we've all had, we've all had to experience with mandatory tools uh, that we need to work with in our workplace. And more uh, often than not, we pretty much hate them because they're not built to be uh, easily used, right? Why do we need product managers for user-facing products? Because we want to convince them it will give them value. If we'll just say the platform usage is mandatory, then we're contradicting our goals of platform engineering. Because instead of making the life of the developers in the company easier, we're just sticking them with another tool that will make them, their life harder, and now they must use. So let's not do that. The second thing that you're going to hear is it's an internal tool. So engineering managers can do it, right? It's not like we don't need to talk with external companies. So why won't you just take care of it? Um, and the reason we can't take care of it is exactly because of what I said before. It requires a different skill set. Engineering managers already have enough of their plate. They need to grow their people. They need to uh, do project management. They need to lead the architecture and the technical things. They can't necessarily also take on the responsibility of market research, user validation, uh, and uh, viability uh, propositioning. So this is why we need someone with a different skill set. We can call it whatever. It doesn't have to be a product manager. We can give it whatever name we want. But we need someone with those skill sets within our team. Next, we're going to hear developers know what developers want. I mean, you're a developer, right? Why can't you just build what makes sense to you? If it will be easy for you to use it, it will probably be easier for everyone to use it. Wrong again, like we said before. Just because something is easy for me to use doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy to use for every developer in the world. If I'll go ahead and build a platform based on what I will uh, be happily using, then the platform will be very good for me, probably not for anyone else. This is the reason why companies like Elasticsearch, Datadog, and uh, 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 Grafana all have product managers. Even though their products are aimed at developers, it doesn't mean that it's aimed at the single developers. It is aimed at all of the developers. And the job of the product manager is to take all of those input and consolidate it into a cohesive product that someone can actually use. And finally, uh, look, those are all very good arguments. Uh, I, I, I really, I hear you. But uh, we just don't have the headcount. We can't afford the additional rec. Uh, so I, I just can't bring on anybody. Um, so if this is the case, you should remind your manager that you currently have 2, 5, 10, 30 engineers building something that may not be valuable for a company. So the cost of it not being valuable is not the cost of one rec. It can be the cost of 30 uh, people doing the wrong thing. So even at this case, uh, even at this point, even with all those arguments, you still may not be able to convince someone that you actually need an additional headcount just for this. And that's OK. But what you need to know is that you need someone with those skill set 
within the uh, organization. So uh, there are those rare engineers, those rare breeds who are very good at engineering skills, but can also do all the go-to-market and use the research. Make sure that you have one of those at your disposal. Uh, and even possibly leading the organization, right? If you can have someone leading the platform organization that is not necessarily the best engineer, but is the best at understanding what the rest of the engineers at the company want, this can benefit you, even if you don't get the additional rec for a product manager, but just have to settle for uh, the resources that you have. So finally, the internal developer platform Let's stop calling it a platform. It's not a platform, it's a product. It's an internal product. The users are the developer within our company, but it is a product, and we should treat it like one. We should have a product manager for it, or at least we should recognize that there are product management skills required in order to build one that is sustainable and is used by the rest of the developers in the company. OK, so let's summarize. We talk about what an IDB is and that the goal and our main goal is to enable the rest of the developers in a company. It's never to take ownership. It's never uh, to push uh, uh, tools onto our developers. It's to help them move faster. We talked about uh, the fact that if we want to help them move faster, we need to solve problems that they actually have. Once we identify those problems, uh, we need to, uh, sorry, and if we want to know what are those problems that the developer have, we should just ask them. It's as simple as that. Um, we should make sure that the solutions are valuable for them. They're not just using cool technologies. Uh, and as we build those solutions, we should iterate again and again and be in constant uh, uh, collaboration with our users, who are the developers in the company, in order to make sure that we're on the right track. Finally, in order to do all those things, if you have a product manager on your side, your life will be much easier. And you'll have much higher success rate at making the life of the rest of the developers in your company easier. That is it. I hope it was informative. I hope that it will help any of you with platform organizations actually deliver value and increase the chances of you doing something that is helpful for the rest of the developers in your company. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take some. Thank you very much. If I open the um, stage for uh, folks that are here to ask questions, we have a question online. And I'll just read it to you. With the recent advancement in AI, tools and workflows are rapidly changing. As a result, what might have seemed state of the art a few months ago could already feel outdated. Given this context, do you perceive a risk that substantial investment in a particular platform could inadvertently lock a tech company into an outdated technology? That's a good question. Uh... So, so basically, if I understand correctly, uh, what the writer is saying is, look, AI is blooming. Uh, we just heard about it in the, rest, in the last couple of days. Everything is re being replaced with rates of weeks, and, and advancements are, are moving in, in the rates of weeks. How do, we manage me how do we manage that? How do we make sure that we're not stuck with all technology when moving forward? So I, I think, first of all, that's, that's a great question, right? It's a great question because uh, it's kind of the questions that we can always ask. With every technological advancement, this question will keep on coming back to us. So, so today it's AI. Uh, yesterday it was search. Tomorrow it's maybe, uh, I don't know, something else. But what I think, like the way I look at it is when I build a platform team, I try not to build it around technology but I try to build it around problems that we're trying to solve. So if the different teams that I have are having problem with maintaining the models in production, so the, team is the platform team would be responsible with providing tools that help maintain models in production. Uh, yes, of course, those tools may change over time, and we may introduce new tools. And whenever a new tool comes out, we need to uh, consider, is it worth the time changing or can we stick with the old technology because there's no real value to it. But again, what drives this conversation is not the technology, is not the should I use this new tool, is what value would the different teams that my platform is serving would get from that. And if the answer is no value, it's just a new tool, then there's just no need. Uh, when you're value and problem oriented and not tool oriented, it kind of makes life easier uh, and it makes it easier to make decisions on should I, should I invest time or should I not invest time 
in making this move. So I don't have like a, a specific answer because it's a general question, but, but that's the framework that I use to make those decisions. Cool. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hey, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. That's pretty cool. I have to really enjoy the way that you put it and, and also the learnings that you have. Um, I mean, I work pretty much in the data platform team, so I'm just trying to understand a little bit from your perspective. Uh, learnings that you had when it comes to how you discover the needs of the developers. Do you have any processes, any frameworks that you use, or any lessons learned that you had? Because sometimes it really feels like you're solving a problem, it's really impactful, and then once you have something live and you want to test, then you people say, oh, maybe that's not exactly what I needed, or maybe that's not really helping me. Maybe if you could share a little bit on that, because I think it's quite a challenge for, for us as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's a good question, and I, and I hope I'll answer it correctly. Um, for me, all of the lessons learned are kind of the lesson that product manager learned 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago or when, when it became a thing, right? When we moved from project management to product management and we tried to put the user in the center, those are the kind of lessons that I want us to transition into platform engineering teams. So the lessons would be on the lines of, okay, when we build this new thing, we need to know in advance that there is a high probability that no one will adopt it. So can we waste, instead of a month building it, prototyping it with two days and testing it with the rest of the developers. Uh, like, always, uh, always optimize on that. Um, I can talk about some of the tools that we use within our, our, our platform team that we actually borrowed from the uh, product and engineering team, right? So for example, experimentation. If you ask a product manager, how do you test out a new feature? How do you plan a feature? What he will say is, OK, so first of all, I start with a problem. An hypothesis, right? An hypothesis, I think my users have this problem. Then I talk to them, and I need to make sure that they do have this problem. Then he'll go and say, I need to hypothesize a solution. I think that this solution will solve this problem. Then I go to them, and I talk to them, and I make sure that they have this problem. But then I create an experiment. I say, OK, in order to make sure that my hypothesis is correct, I want to build something, and then I want to see this change in the user behavior. For example, I want to release this feature, and I want to see uh, the 10% of the user click the button over the next few weeks. This will give me a good indication that I'm in the right direction. So instead of just committing ahead to, OK, we need to fully flunch, uh, build this whole feature, I want to take incremental steps in the direction uh, that will show me that I'm in the right direction. And we can do the same when we're working on the platform. OK, so I think that our developer needs a simpler way to control the uh, uh, configuration on their Kubernetes manifest. What can we do? Maybe we can release one specific thing and measure how often it's used, how many of the different teams actually adopted this. If we see that it, this is useful and viable for them, we can, uh, we can add more different configurations and more ways for the developers to, to use this platform. If it's not, let's throw it away. Let's throw it away and get, go back to the sketching board and think of a different solution, or maybe to make sure that it, this really is a problem. Like, just don't be away, afraid to throw things away. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Hi, thanks for the presentation. You mentioned that, that there is some sort of a story about just rebranding things. Ops, DevOps, SRE, and stuff like this. Uh, how much do you think the personnel contributes to this uh, rebranding story? Like, you just rename the SRE team to the platform team and hope for the best. So you mean, uh, like, how important are the people to make this successful? So d do you mean, like, do SRE and DevOps require different people? Or, or can you just, I, I just want to make sure that I answer the correct question. So to, to rephrase the question, how likely the transition from SRE to platform engineering is if you just rename the, oh. the, rename the team, give a product manager, and then? Yeah, so, so th that's a good question. And then the, 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 the answer is that there's no way, right? Just because it's not, about, it's not even about the people. It's just because, just because you give something a new name doesn't mean that uh, you, you actually set it up. This is why, uh, in my opinion, 
DevOps transitions are hard. Um, SRE transitions are hard because we take people who are used to do one thing, and then without enough explanation, we tell them, hey, now you need to do this thing. But what is the difference? They'll just fall back to the old, old habits. Uh, if you want this kind of transformation, if you want to move from uh, DevOps to platform engineering or for SRE to platform engineering, it's, it's in, my, in my opinion, it's really important that the entire team understand the shift from owning thing, maintaining thing, to delivering value to the rest of the company. Like, if you will get to the point where what drives your weekly or bi-weekly meeting are, those are our goals in the sense of users are adopting X percent of our platform. Um, and that will be the driver to the rest of your meeting. Like, OK, they're not adopting our platforms. What should we do? Or they are adopting our platform. Great. What else should we do? It's got a much higher chance to succeed than just saying, OK, now you're not SRE. You're uh, platform engineering. But your goals are, you know, j just define them or, or handle ops or, or do your thing. Like, I, my, my perspective is that the most important way to get people to shift is to change the way they frame go their goals. Like, what are they, me they measured against? The rest will follow. Right. Uh, thank you for the talk. I really appreciate it. It relates a lot to what we do. Um, you had mentioned that bad DevX can lead to, lead to attrition. Um, I'm wondering, is that based on your subjective experience? Is that based on uh, metrics and scientific research? Like, w what makes you say that besides just anecdotally? Because uh, attrition is b frequently based on so many different reasons, and it's a rather complex concept. Yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, that's actually based on a source where I can like, show you it offline. Uh, but it's also like uh, personal experience, right? I know that at Epstagon, uh, we had ver a very good developer experience. Uh, and, and that was when I talk to people and I see why they're not living. I have like the daily one-on-ones with all of the engineers. Not daily, like quarterly one-on-ones with all of the engineers. And uh, I try to gauge what are their motivations for staying and what is important for them. That's pretty much uh, always up the list. Uh, and then on the other side is the developers that we attracted where some of them, well, a lot of them, was because of those reasons. Uh, because the Israel tech scene is a very startup-y tech scene, and you got uh, startups that have a better DevX, and the startups that are trying to move fast that doesn't necessarily have the DevX. Uh, so this was a card that we actually played to attract talent. Um, so it's, it's kind of a mix of the both. Uh, but, but definitely, I wouldn't say it's uh, uh, make or break in the sense that uh, if you have developer experience, you'll 100% uh, maintain your people. If you, and if you don't have uh, developer experience, you 100% won't. It's just a big factor. Yeah, there's a number of especially larger companies, that, not to name names, that have spent a lot of time and effort uh, building great developer experience where it's incredibly easy to move out code, test code, whatever, um, but also have some of the worst attrition rates as well. So I was curious how those kind of things went. But it sounds like, um, are you focused mostly on the startup space, or, you know, we can also continue this a after. I'd be curious. Thank you. All right. I think we're out of um, time. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. And then see you, at, see you later. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>